Our lives are built around modern technology. We use it to communicate, to keep memories, to play, to get directions, to order food, a ride, drugs, and sometimes we just need it to breathe. There's a new wave of advanced technology and it's changing our economy in ways nobody can control. Some view technology as a great evil that slowly diminishes our humanity, while others view it as a way to bring the world closer together to help solve some of our greatest challenges. We will take a look at some of the emerging innovations that have become popular in recent times. Virtual reality, a recent form of digital media technology that immerses its viewers in a stereoscopic rendition of a computer simulated environment. I've spoken to various individuals about the discourse between humans and technology. So surely, with our increasing dependence on technology, how can we control what is everywhere in almost every facet of our lives? How can we control the hand that we're dealt with against technology's invisible hand? What could go wrong? Right now, I am working as a freelance artist and a game programmer. Um, and I just make my own game projects and work a bit on the side. I'm developing uh, games for mobile at the moment. Just, you know, quick um, games for iPhone or whatever. Um, and that, that's a growing market. Um, so the gaming industry, um, I think it's something like 8% a year in revenue. That's the increase every year, and so you know that's the global gaming industry. Um, it's, you, do you think it's going to stop? Uh, no, I don't. I think it's it's probably like I mean it, it's overtaken film and you know every other medium of entertainment in terms of revenue, and it's the newest one. So you know, um, considering how fast it's grown, I don't think it will stop. You know, with the introduction of VR, um, where do you think that will take us? I mean, the, uh, at the very end of that is some sort of like matrix sort of reality where people just uh, are living in a virtual space all the time. But um, yeah, VR is just like a sort of step towards that. Um, just being immersed, creating virtual worlds, you know, uh, sort of like um, freedom the freedom to exist in, you know, and be whatever you want to be, do whatever you want to do. I think in Japan, for example, there's, there's a, uh, a growing population of, of young people, young males in particular, who just you know, simply refuse to participate in, in the world. You know, they, they, they stay in their rooms um, and just exist in a virtual space, basically, their entire lives. And uh, I think VR would just make that you know, um, allow them to go even deeper and, and you know, lose people completely. VR is uh, just as accessible, or just as, um, it can open as many doors to film as it does for games. Um, it sort of uh, adds a new dimension to films that weren't there before, and um, we're seeing filmmakers now sort of try to approach filmmaking with VR in mind, and it's sort of like leading to interesting results. Um, and that will always continue to evolve as well, and yeah, it, it, it's, go, it's going to change film. There will always exist, you know, the, the old way of doing things, the uh, you know, two-dimensional film and games, but VR will just be this, like, new thing that can offer up a different sort of experience. Will it become a standard, do you think? Standard? Uh, a standardised medium um, in filming? Um, 
It's hard to say. I don't know. I don't think so because just because um, the fact that with the VR film there are a lot of problems, such as like how do you uh, you can't really direct where someone is looking. So you know things like you might be looking one way and miss like something that's happening another way. And I don't know. I don't. I don't see that ever replacing you know a good well-directed, you know, traditional 2D film. Um, so I don't know if it will become the standard, but, you know, who knows. Way down the future, it might be, I don't know. Well, speaking of fitness, as the colder weather hits us, it's very, very easy to get a little bit relaxed on our fitness regime. Good news is Richie is here with your own motivator in the form of Fitbit. Hi, Richie. Good morning. And yes, I am ablaze with excitement this morning. Uh, Fitbit have just released their brand new product. It's called the Fitbit Blaze. Now, this is pretty exciting because it's totally different technology and it's it like is. a personal trainer on our wrist. That's right. So we've all been trying out the Fitbits and we've been tracking our steps, but this takes it one step further. The VR field is uh, an interesting area at the moment. Um, I've been working on uh, helping uh, the learning uh, industry utilize VR um, to engage with their students. Um, you know, technology is amazing in that you can use it as a novelty, I think. You can use it as a, um, as a way to be able to deploy learning you know, syllabuses and, and the like. But I think one of the most interesting areas is using it as a way to engage. You know, there are uh, a million ways that you can deliver information, um, but there's usually only one learning outcome that you want. How you get to that specific learning outcome, I think is the challenge for all um, education professionals. So I thought that um, VR could be a very useful um, area to delve into when it comes to learning. You know, um, what I found is by showing some of these teachers, effectively doing a train the trainer kind of course, um, that by upskilling the teachers themselves, um, they they feel way more um, enticed and motivated to try out a more innovative, innovative ways uh, to help their students. These days, a lot of people use on-the-job training, use in-job accreditation to build up um, their, both their work skills and also some kind of formalised training. So again, a way to bring people back into um, the formal training sector um, needs some kind of um, innovative approach and the utilisation of technology is a great way to do that. For example, um, if you're talking about um, occupational health and safety or anything that requires verbalisation, you're going to need a presenter. Now that presenter is going to have to come with a certain amount of skills and those skills usually is more to do with being able to talk to a screen. But when you tell them that the 360 degree camera is actually a person and that person is going to be watching you and you've got to keep them interested and they treat the camera like a person, their way of conveying information actually becomes way more personable. And I've seen this myself where people can talk to a camera and it's, and it's kind of detached. But when they start seeing themselves play back in the VR environment, they realize that a 360 degree camera, because of the, the, just the actual device itself, means that a person has the ability to look around um, and act like a person, them understanding that means that the way they deliver the message will actually be much more as a one-on-one. -on -one. For example, if you're in a room and you're talking to them, normally you will just walk off frame, out of frame. That's all you do. In 360, you say, hey, come with me, watch me. Step this way, follow me while I walk around to this fire extinguisher or whatever it may be. So it becomes a much more human to human experience. Ironically, you know, you still have this weird ass lens looking there like HAL 9000, it's staring at you motionlessly. But when you see the student in there and you realize that that person is seeing yourself speaking to them, the penny drops. And I've seen that actually you know, happened with a teacher, and it's fantastic. I think VR is going to be way more fused with AI. One thing that happens in a VR right now is that you get to absorb information, but there's no specific feedback mechanism for the VR system or the app to understand if you've absorbed that knowledge. I was just saying before that Google sent me 
a montage of just my daughter from around one year old up to six and it chose its own title saying gee they grow up fast so that said that to me today now that's the scary part where it's actually making decisions on your behalf okay google take me to ermington navigating to ermington So I've been an early childhood teacher for about seven years. I've been working with children from birth up until preschool predominantly. At the moment I'm trying to delve into more child psychology sort of work and working with children with additional needs and things of that nature. And it's been a very interesting sort of path from coming from a teaching sort of background and having a lot of experience working with children just on a day-to-day -day basis in the teacher sort of setting. Children are constantly developing different skills through every, every year of their life. So once you're an adult, you've formed a lot of habits and you've created your personality already, but as a child, you're still sort of learning how the world works around you. So it's, it's very different and the always changing nature of technology, um, does that affect the way children are developed um, at this point in time? Like in, in this world where you know modern technology is, is running um, the human race. Yeah, no definitely. It's something that we hadn't realised would be an issue until very recently. So working with children for the past, what, seven years, I said, it didn't used to be an issue of how much screen time children were getting until I think in the past two or three years. So mo most recently I worked with children in the baby room, so children of zero to two years of age, which, and they're very little. They're still developing a lot of skills and it's a very prime time, I think, for interacting and teaching children. So to come into that sort of room and to be a teacher and children of that age, it was amazing to see the issue of screen time. So parents would come and ask, oh, how much time do you need, or do children need on, on an iPad? And even inquire about whether they should get their children an iPad as a genuine sort of babysitter sort of thing. At such a young age, they're already learning, they're associating downtime or busy time as time on a screen. So as you get older, you develop and you form habits or things that you're used to which undoubtedly would mean when they're older older, they would rely a lot on technology to occupy themselves rather than doing other things. But I also think for kids, um, technology is something that they don't know anything else other than. You know, they have grown up with it from day one. My, my son was swiping a screen when he was six months old, so he understands that technology completely. So I think for the... Um, for the more experienced and the wiser and older um, demographic, there has to be probably a bit more of an acceptance that technology is moving pretty quickly, that it's accelerated, um, and it needs to be embraced to a certain extent. It is something that comes with, with our development, I think, as humans as well. So it is something that teachers need to learn to sort of embrace in a classroom too. And it has been a struggle for a lot of the older teachers to sort of take on teaching with technology, if that makes sense. But there's a lot of benefits to it as well, as well as the cons. So the cons would be things like children are very, not quick, but expectations and their willingness to wait, I think, has shifted a lot. So we're seeing a lot of children that may be a bit more impatient than they would normally because technology does allow us to access everything quite quickly rather than having to wait like even waiting for turns, I find children now just are very impatient and very demanding in one way. But technology does also allow us to teach in a very diverse sort of way. Because it's quick, it allows us to do different things on the spot. So teachers have access to different types of materials and can build and extend on children's learning faster and in a more meaningful way because we have access to all the technology rather than having to get them to wait and do something to follow up on a learning experience later. So while the children are, I guess, I 
I'm a bit, I'm a bit torn too whether it's a good or a bad thing to be honest. Alexa, what's the weather in Sydney at the moment? In Sydney, Australia, it's 22 degrees with clear skies. Tonight, you can look for mostly clear skies with a low of 16 degrees. Alexa, thank you. You're welcome. Humanizing, see? It's all about the humanizing. You know, the more we accept them as just another step for uh, you know, the integration into our daily lives, um, the more we will be seeing these permeate um, you know, our kind of daily activities. Alexa, tell Brandon a bedtime story. This is the story of President Brandon. Once upon a time... Alexa, stop. So right away, it comes up with a story that is just for Brandon. And it does a story about a boy called Brandon, and he does this and this, and at the end it says, Time to go to get time to go to bed, Brandon. Good night. Crazy, right? This is happening right now. But the kids think there's another person in the house called Alexa. And they use it. I've got to whisper it because it can hear me. That's where things are headed. Services that kind of sit there behind the scenes and it's about hiding the technology. That's where I think technology is kind of headed. VR is actually about hiding the technology. When you make a VR production, what are you doing? You are hiding all of the lights. You're having to integrate anything that's within that visible space to be as if it's part of the scene. As a person who's you know, in their 40s, I believe that it's up to me and me alone to stay um, in touch and current with all these products. And to be honest, having kids under the age of 10 kind of forces you by necessity to, to be understanding. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to help them with their homework, for example. One of the biggest um, events that I still is clear in my mind is I went to a teacher night and the teachers were telling us all about um, well, the homework, the assignments, and all the things they'd be doing. And how many parents put their hand up in fear, saying, but I, I don't know how to do any of that. I don't know how to, how do I, how do I help my kid when they're doing things that I don't even know? How to do. That's the biggest issue right now. That's also a commercial opportunity, I think, for people to help upskill parents and maybe educators who are you know, ha haven't had to upskill themselves for a long time. Educators need to continue to be educated, and they need to do that off their own bat. Otherwise, they will risk um, being left behind.